Well, a president stands before the nation. He stands alone and he stands wondering. Wondering what he's going to say to a world that is watching. Wondering what he's going to say to a world that is listening. Wondering what he's going to say to a world that's waiting. But he knows that he has to say something. Something that's going to make a difference. Something that will give them hope. Something that will calm their fears. And so the President of the United States stands before his troops. And he stands before the nation. And he stands before the world and he declares, we stand ready for battle. We stand united in a common cause. We're fighting for our freedom. We're fighting for our right to live. And then he declares with a thunderous voice, this will be our day of independence. Now some of you are trying to form a mental picture in your mind of what that must have looked like some 200, 250 years ago. But I'm not talking about 200 or 250 years ago. What I've just described is a scene from the movie Independence Day. The fight for freedom in this movie wasn't a battle from tyranny or oppression, but from annihilation. It was a fight for freedom, but a fight altogether different than our fight for freedom some 200 years ago. I use this simply to demonstrate that Independence Day can mean different things to different people. If you were an American 200 plus years ago, it meant freedom from British oppressive rule. If you lived in Germany, Independence Day was the day that they tore down that Berlin Wall. If you lived in Russia, it was the day that communism was overturned and a new freedom was found. If you're an alcoholic, Independence Day is the day you put the bottle down. If you're a drug addict, it's the day you walked away from the drugs for good. If you were in an abusive relationship, it's the day that you woke up without the fear of being hurt or the fear of being hit. If you're a Christian, Independence Day is the day that you put your faith in Christ. Freedom and independence are words that we use quite freely and I think quite loosely in our culture today. We talk about the right to think, the freedom to think, the freedom to speak, the freedom to choose, the need for independence. And yet so often the freedom that we have gained is a freedom that we so quickly give away. What makes a drug addict go back? Or an alcoholic? Well, we say simply they're addicted. What makes an abused wife go back to the abuse? Well, we say they're dysfunctional. What makes a Russia want to go back to communism? Well, you say it's simply it's all they've ever known. And while some of these examples make us think, there's one question we need to look at this morning, and it's a sobering one. What makes us turn back? Why do we, as believers in Jesus Christ, go back? Why do we run back to the bondage? Why do we run back to the shackles of sin? Why do we seem to run back to the ruins? Why, if we've been set free in Christ, do we seem to forfeit that freedom so easily? This morning we're going to look at this battle, a battle over our freedom. And we're going to do so by looking at a body of believers in the midst of a battle over their freedom. They're not fighting for their freedom, but they're fighting over their freedom. They're not fighting to gain their freedom, but they're fighting to maintain their freedom. This morning we're going to look at what I like to call the believer's battle for independence. We're going to look at what we're fighting to avoid, 
And we're going to look at what we need to battle to advance. This morning we're going to take a good look at the Christian's declaration of independence. And it is found in Galatians chapter 5. If you would turn there with me here this morning, Galatians chapter 5. It is on page uh, 1,340 in your pew Bibles. Galatians chapter 5. And I want us to begin by looking at verse 1. The Christian's declaration of independence is summarized in one simple verse. And that verse is found in verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. One thing is certain from this short little verse, and that is this. The battle for the believer is to avoid turning back. To avoid turning back to a life of bondage. The battle for the Christian is to avoid going back to that which enslaved them. For you were set free in Christ Jesus. Only don't fall back. Don't turn back and be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And so the battle for us this morning is to fight against the tendency to want to go back. Paul writes to a body of believers that were no different. They'd been set free in Christ, and yet they're fighting to turn back. Fighting to go back. Fighting, literally fighting, to give up their freedom. Paul writes to a church that's in the midst of a battle. The church is battling over theology. They're battling over doctrine. They're battling within themselves, and they're battling amongst themselves. At the central core of each battle, we see a body of believers battling to go back. The first battle we find is the battle to turn back to the old forms, to go back to the old structure. We find that in verses 2 through 12. Paul writes, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. In other words, if you in the New Testament and faith in Christ decide to go back to the Old Testament and the old way of doing things, he says... I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you've fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. The first battle we find is the battle to turn back to the old forms. Paul takes great pains to describe the battle for us, and he spares no punches as he does. He describes the battle to go back to the old way of working and striving to please God, falling back to a form of religion that grinds its way along, seeking to do enough, seeking to give enough, seeking to suffer enough, To please God. Paul writes to a church that was seeking to leave their faith in Christ. To follow a man-made form of religion. A religion that relied upon 
one's ability to keep their salvation. And while they knew that their salvation had been won for them on the cross, they were deceived into thinking that they could maintain that salvation based on their own self-efforts. Paul tells them, you were running well. You were running really well. But somehow, some way, someone came in and lied to them. Literally cast a spell on them. And tricked them into thinking something contrary to the truth that they knew to be true concerning Christ and all he did on the cross. Paul questions them by saying, don't you know that to do such a thing is to abandon your faith in Christ, and even worse, is to abandon Christ altogether? Don't you know that to go back to living under the legal structure of the Old Testament is to place yourself once again under a yoke of bondage? Don't you know that if you do that, Christ is of no value to you. Then he raises the question, who hindered you from the truth? Who came in and told you to go back? Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole loaf? Don't you know that a little arsenic poisons the whole bottle? Don't you know that a little poison in your belief system will slowly but surely destroy your entire belief system. It's like a computer virus. It enters into the computer silently, subtly, by stealth, but soon it begins to destroy every single program that exists on your computer. Paul is dealing with a faith virus. A virus that entered in by stealth and was seeking to undermine the Christian faith that Christ died for and we were set free for. And yet the danger for us today is to turn back to the same old forms, the same old way. How many of us here this morning came to Christ by faith and yet live each day by works? How many of us live in the world of guilt because you feel that you can never measure up to God's expectations? How many of us live in guilt because somehow we failed him again and again and again? How many of us judge one another based on what we do, based on what we think, based on what we do as believers. How many believers have been hurt by legalism in some form or fashion? We often sing, give me some of that old time religion. But sometimes that old time religion can get us into all kinds of trouble. I have friends who have come out of legalistic churches, and I watch them struggle. Watch them struggle for years. They struggle with guilt. They struggle with rules. And because of all of that, they struggle with God. How do I ever approach and race into the throne room of God and into his arms to hold me and to hug me when he's constantly displeased with me? And then I watch them struggle to go back. They just seem to want to go back. Back to the old rules, the same old rules, the same old guilt, same old church, same old forms. The battle for the believer is to avoid turning back and basing everything in terms of our standing before God on what we do or don't do instead of what Christ has done. Well, the next battle we face is the battle to turn back to the old flesh. We find this as...
in verses 13 through 21. And we all know this battle. We find ourselves going back to the old life, the old habits, to the old patterns, to the old friends, to the old sinful behavior, to the old fallen flesh. Verse 13 tells us, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. The battle for us is is to avoid going back to the old forms. The battle for us is to avoid going back to that old flesh. And just in case there's any confusion as to whether we've ever done such a thing, Paul includes a lengthy list for us in verses 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. In other words, you can't miss them. So if you ever have any concern of how your walk is walking, you come to a place like this, and Paul says, and Scripture says, it becomes quite evident. Which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Well, none of us would go there, right? But enmities, strife, jealousy, Outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It is amazing to me how easily and how often We spray the perfume of divinity over our behavior and thinking that what we're doing, we are doing for God. And yet when I read this list, God ain't having nothing to do with it. Paul tells us it's a lengthy list, but he also tells us it's not an exhaustive list. He says, I'm just going to give you enough to let it simmer and for you to chew on, but there's a whole bunch more. It should tell us there's quite a bit of ungodly behavior that he's left off the list. I think we can come up with a whole lot more. He's just given us enough to start us thinking. His goal is to help us to understand that there is a battle going on inside of us. At the core of every believer, there's a battle to go back to the old behavior, to the old haunts, to the old places, to the old people to the old patterns, the old behavior that continually seeks to dominate and to control us. And I think think how many of us, in some form or fashion, know this kind of bondage. How many of us can find something in this list that we know has a grip on our lives or you know has had a grip on your life But every day you're fighting with that tension to go back. Deep down inside, I think quite often, there's a desire to really want to go back. Some of you here this morning might be struggling with immorality. You don't want anyone to know what you watch at night. You don't want anyone to know about the relationship that you are slowly but subtly developing. You know you're involved in something you shouldn't be. But you just can't seem to stop. Some of us here this morning might be struggling with anger. Children don't respond the way we'd like them to, and then, watch out. Or every day, you go to work, and you're just mad. Mad at your boss. Mad at your wife. Mad at your children. Mad at the traffic light. You're just mad. Or maybe you don't get the recognition recognition you deserve. And inside, man, you're just boiling, simmering. Maybe a decision didn't go your way. And it's just sitting there eating away at you. Eating away, eating away, until you're convinced in your own mind that you've got to do something with it. And some of us here this morning, oh, you don't have anger issues. You don't have immorality issues. Maybe you're fighting with jealousy. Somebody next to you got the promotion, and you can't stand it. And you can't stand them. 
Maybe someone has a better voice than you. Maybe somebody knows more about the Bible than you. So you begin to share small comments that will persuade people's opinions concerning that somebody else. Oh, we are often not guilty of the sin of carousing or drunkenness or having an affair. But somehow we have just minimized the danger and the damage that can occur to little things like, I don't know, gossip, malice, slander. The more subtle, refined sins for the palate. Some of us here are in bondage to our desires, to our decadence. Maybe some are enslaved to impurity of all sorts and sizes. Maybe some of us here this morning are fighting with someone. You just seem to find yourself constantly disputing. But most of us have to admit there's something in this list that we struggle with. And then there's the battle that rages within us all. A conflict we all face and a conflict that we can't avoid. And here's the conflict. We want to live a life that's pleasing to God. We really do. But something inside of us wants to go back to the old sinful patterns and lifestyle. Verse 17 describes the battle for us. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. The spirit might be moving in you for that which is pleasing to God that which will be pleasing to the Spirit of God. But the flesh is in opposition to it at all times. This side of heaven, this battle, doesn't end. It continues. The imagery here is of two things lined up in conflict. Two people squared off as in battle. It's used of two individuals coming face to face in a duel. Remember the old westerns? You know, where if there was a dispute or an argument, they just shot at each other. It's the good old days. You had your six-shooter, and they had their six-shooter lined up back to back, and then you paste it all off, and your hope is you can turn around faster than the other person can, get that pistol out of your holster, right? The good old-fashioned duel. Or they'd look at each other face to face. But usually there's some distance in between. This is far closer than that. The imagery here is of two individuals fighting with what is, is um, termed the short knives. They're in tight. Each person responding very quickly to another person's actions. They're in close proximity. And so there's a battle raging within our being, and it's a battle between the Spirit of God and our ungodly flesh. And I mean, they're right in it. Can you imagine that? Every moment of every day, the Spirit of God indwelling us is battling for us and battling within us with us. And they're going at it, tooth and nail. And here's a crazy thing for me, the staggering thing for me, is God could just strike us dead in any moment for doing what we're doing and thinking what we're thinking. He decides to go toe-to-toe with us, hoping, as if God could hope, that we'll give up the ghost, we'll wave the white flag, and we'll yield to what he is doing. The Holy Spirit turning us towards heaven, turning us towards Christ, the flesh battling to turn us back, turn us back to the old life, the old sin. And yet, tragically, how many of us turn back? Well, once we've turned back to the old forms, once we've turned back to the old flesh, we find the third battle. And we see it in verse 15 and again in verse 26. And that's the battle to go back to the old fighting. That's the battle to go back to the old battles. Look at what it says in verse 15 and then 26. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you are consumed 
by one another. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. This kind of fighting shouldn't surprise us. I think of Scripture and I think of the one another's. Love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another. This is a different kind of list of one another's. Not a very good list. When we turn back to the old forms of bondage, we have to understand this. When we turn back to the old form of bondage, we become miserable people. We're saved, but not really joyful. We become miserable people. As miserable people, we quickly turn back to the old flesh. Why? Because we seek instant satisfaction and gratification because we're miserable. So somehow, some way, take the pain away, take the misery away, do something, but the old forms leave us miserable, and in our misery, we go back to the old flesh. And those of us in the flesh only know how to do one thing, and that is to destroy. We destroy ourselves, and we destroy others. We become self-reliant, we become self-righteous, we become self-centered, we become self absorbed. And the outcome is then seen in how we treat one another in the body of Christ. Paul says we bite one another, we devour one another, and as a result we are consumed by one another. The word picture here is of a wild pack of animals preying upon one another attacking until they have destroyed each other and not one animal is left standing. It would be as if a pack of hyenas didn't have anything else to chew apart. So they turned inwardly and began going after each other and it is relentless. There's no greater bondage a church can fall into than the one described here. It's like a cancer that eats away at the body of Christ until every cell is destroyed and the body is lifeless. I remember when I found out my mother had cancer many years ago. It was two weeks after we came back from our honeymoon. And my mom said she was going to the hospital. And when I heard that it was cancer and it was late stage four, I knew what was coming. And I thought anything but this. I mean, I didn't want to see my mom die, but I most certainly didn't want to see her die this way. And I remember watching the cancer work its way through her body. I remember her fighting to stay alive. Fighting to stay alive. But there was nothing she could do. In fact, there was nothing that anyone could do. And the cancer just tore her body up. Continued to attack her life until her life was no more. And it tore me up. When I found out, I came home and I cried like a baby. I didn't want to see what I knew I would see. And it still does to this day. There's nothing worse than cancer in the body. Except cancer in the body of Christ. These are real battles, men and women. And they're battles we are to avoid at all costs. We were never set free, Paul tells us, to fight these kind of battles. Our battle is different. And so we need to know what we need to avoid, but we most certainly need to know what we're called to advance. The whole essence and the big idea of chapter 5 is this. The battle for the believer is to avoid turning back to a life of bondage. But to use our freedom 
to follow Christ fully. The battle for us is to avoid going back, but to use our freedom to follow Christ fully. Our fight for freedom is to avoid going back to a life shackled by sin, but to use our liberty to live for the Lord completely. Ours is not a freedom from something, but it is a freedom for something. Better is a freedom for someone. Ours is a freedom to live for our Lord Jesus Christ. Ours, here this morning, is a freedom to walk by faith. Don't go back to the old forms, but ours is a freedom to walk by faith. Not bound by legalistic structures, but free to hold on to the promises of God. Promises concerning who He is, what He has done, and what He continues to do. That's the difference between the form and the faith. It's not about what we do. Faith is about what He has done. The old forms say all the significance and my security and worth is wrapped up in me. But in faith, my security, my worth, my significance is all wrapped up in him. God is pleased with me because he's absolute, 100% guaranteed, perfectly pleased in his son, Jesus Christ. And I often forget that when he looks at me, he does see me. He sees me through and through. But he sees me through the lenses of his son. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that he does. Because when I look in the mirror and see, I see something different than that in me. But we all beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his likeness. I'm grateful for that. Paul tells us that we can have no other view. If anybody's come in and twisted that or turned that in any way, so that the measure of all things is about all that, Paul says you should have no other view but only one of faith working through love. It's our faith in Christ that brings pleasure to God. And it's our faith in him that has brought about our freedom. We make a fatal mistake the minute we think for a second that we can earn our salvation or that we can keep it by slaving away, by keeping all sorts of man-made religious rules and regulations and standards. Many here this morning, and it's not just unique to who we are, it's across the globe. It's across the church in America where we've experienced this in our own lives. Early in my faith, I came out of a legalistic church. I know all about that. It took me going on a short-term missions trip to Asia to get away from it all, to look back into it, to realize just how strong its influence was. You know what it's like to be shunned by the religious elite, all because you don't fit in to their categories of what it means to be a Christian. You don't think the way they think, you don't act the way they act, or talk the way they talk, and therefore you're excluded, you're ignored, you're isolated, or you're judged. I've been there, done that. I have friends of mine who've been there and done that. I have friends of mine who are still there and who still do this. They're my friends. They're my brothers and sisters in the Lord. But I am always ever aware of the damaging results of such a position. They'll tell you what to wear, how to look, who to date, who to avoid, They tell you what to do. They tell you where to go. They tell you how much to give. They tell you what's right. They tell you what's wrong. And they make decisions for you in the name of Jesus Christ. But my, oh my, how far from Christ they really are. We are free 
to follow Christ fully. Free to listen to him. Free to focus on him. Free to walk with him. Free to be changed by him. And free to be more like him. I don't want to be more like you. Unless you are walking a whole lot more like him. And hallelujah, we don't have to work at this alone. Verse 16 tells us if we walk by the Spirit, we're not going to carry out the deeds of the flesh. We don't have to go back. But with God's help, we can move forward. We can move onward and we can move upward. Paul uses a wonderful word here to describe our Christian walk. It's the Greek word, and it's one of my favorite words, peripateo. where we get the English word perpetual. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, we are to walk, peripateo, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Perpetual. I think of my son when he was young. My son Will, especially Will. He was always in perpetual motion. He was always moving. He's still always moving. He was always climbing, climbing the chairs, climbing the sofa, climbing out of his crib, had mom and dad climbing the walls. And he had this tremendous zeal to climb, and that boy was always on the move. Perpetual motion. As Christians, we are to be in perpetual motion always climbing, always to be looking up. Stagnation is not an option for the Christian. We're to be moving forward to moving upward. And the most liberating truth that we can rest in this morning is this. We don't have to do it alone. In fact, Scripture tells us we're not to do it alone. Walk with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you will walk differently every step of the way. God's provided the Holy Spirit to help us in the journey, to open our eyes to truth, truth of Christ, truth of the faith, and to provide the power for us to turn from sin. And so even though this battle rages, the flesh and the Spirit It is a battle that can be won, but it cannot be won in our own effort, in our own strength, in our own will, and in our own power. It can only be won when we yield, when we give in, when we drop the stupid knife and allow the Holy Spirit to take over. And when we do, when we give up that battle, There's no greater freedom to be found and no greater fruitful freedom to be displayed. Verse 22 through 23 tells us, For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Because what is Paul saying? You don't need the Old Testament structure to serve as a tutor to tell you what to do right and show you what you've done wrong. When the Spirit of God is operating within your being, you will live in such a way you don't need the tutor anymore. Because you have the Holy Spirit in you. Now, Paul tells us it's not an easy thing to do. In fact, verse 24, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and with its desires. Now, here's the wordplay in the imagery. If we don't do this, we hang on to the knife. And you think for a minute you could go toe-to-toe with the Holy Spirit of God and outduel him. It ain't going to happen. But the imagery here is 
Yeah, we drop the knife and we stop fighting with the Holy Spirit, but in a way, we hang on to the knife and we crucify the passion. We crucify the desires. Scripture tells us in a very real way, we put it to death. Put to death the deeds of the flesh, Paul would write in Colossians. Crucify the flesh and its passions and its desires. We stop fighting with the Holy Spirit. We start fighting, we stop fighting with ourselves. However, we do have a battle and a fight with the old flesh. It tells us that something has to die. And crucifixion, last I checked, is not a pleasant death by any stretch of the imagination. Typically, it is a slow death. It is a painful process. And while scripture tells us Christ was crucified for us, I want to know, I want us all to know this with incredible clarity. He will not crucify our flesh. He leaves that decision to us. We are given the imperative to put to death those things. We are given the imperative instruction to crucify the flesh. He has been crucified for us. Perfect standing before God, but practically speaking, sanctification is about the process of crucifying that old part of us over and over again. Why don't we do it? Because it hurts. It's hard to say no to what our fallen flesh so deeply desires. you got to put it to death. That's hard to do. And so moment by moment we choose to turn back or walk forward, to live in bondage or to exercise our freedom. So here's the thing. For the person who's in bondage to his anger, he has a choice to make. He can let his anger get the best of him, or he can ask God to help him to exercise self-control. The woman or the man who wants to pick up the phone and gossip about someone can bring it to the Lord. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, you will leave that silly phone in the cradle. For the person who's bound by pornography, you can walk away from it today. If you determine to walk by the Spirit and say no to those sinful passions. Now's the time to pick the phone out of the cradle and call someone that you've created a, an accountable relationship with to allow them to help you think it through. Paul then moves on and says, ours is a freedom to walk in unity. Instead of self-serving, self-promoting, self-absorbed, we exist to serve one another, to love one another, to walk with one another. Christ never set us free to use our freedom to beat one another silly or to use it to tear the body of Christ apart. He set us free to come together as his body, to build one another up. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only that which edifies and builds. To be a community characterized by authentic relationships that worships together, proclaims the word of God together, and reaches the world together. A community that's walking with the Spirit will be a community that's patient with one another, gentle with one another, kind to one another. Proverbs tells us what is desirable in a man in his kindness. Be the kind of community that all of us would want to belong to, all of us would have a part in, and all of us would find freedom within. Not a community marked by boasting, envy, biting, destroying, but one characterized by the love of Christ so that when people walk through the doors, of this church, they see a glimpse of heaven on earth. This week, our nation celebrates our day of independence. 
this very day we celebrate our day of independence. Many in this country have long forgotten the battle for our freedom. They've forgotten the tremendous cost to achieve such freedom because we typically take such things for granted. We do the same thing as Christians concerning our faith. We forget. Year after year around the country, the skies are filled with fireworks. We're going to see that tonight. Brilliant displays of color and light are going to fill that darkened sky. And our children will watch in wonder. And we will hear the many oohs and ahs. And even while this nation is bound and is burdened, it is still a celebration of our freedom. One day, we will, before, we will be before the throne of God and the sky will light up with colors and brilliance the eyes have never seen before. And in that day, we will truly celebrate our freedom in Christ because in that moment, we will be free indeed. No more battles, no more struggles, no more fighting, no more tears, no more sorrow, only perfect freedom to love our Lord God completely. Then, and only then, are we going to realize our true independence. But until that time, we are in a battle. A battle that's already been won at the cross, but it's a battle that continues to be won as we walk with him. Each and every day, the battle for the believer is to avoid turning back, but to use our freedom to follow Christ fully. And as we walk in our freedom, may we light up the sky as his wonderful display of lives redeemed from every tribe, every nation, every color, every age. And may people look to the heavens above, to the one who set us free. And then in all ways, and at all times, men and women, may we, as followers of in Jesus Christ, let our freedom ring. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, guide us, grow us, and use us, even today as we go out into the public arena and the social context. We'll be out there rubbing shoulders with all kinds of people and all kinds of bondage, all kinds of pain. As they look to the sky, may they look past the sky towards the heavens. May they take a glance our way. May we have the opportunity to talk to them about what true freedom really is. So may we honor you, not just this day, but every day, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen.